The city of Hamilton has a plan to tackle climate change, which is a good thing since last year it declared a climate emergency. But like many other cities around the world, how to make sure that plan includes issues of equity and accessibility can be tricky. The hammer is no stranger to reinvention and innovation, so let's find out how its plans are proceeding. We're joined from the ambitious city by Hamilton City Councilor Maureen Wilson, Beatrice Ekoko, Project Manager for Environment Hamilton, and Mary Lou Tanner, Principal Planner at the Niagara Planning Group, formerly Hamilton's Manager of Strategic and Environmental Planning. That's them from left to right on your screen, geographically, although not necessarily politically. And we're delighted to welcome all of you uh, to our program this, uh, this evening. I want to just start by asking you, um, give us an update on how well or poorly you think the city is doing with its action on climate change. Uh, Councillor Wilson, you want to start us off? Very good and timely question. I think in declaring an emergency, you would assume there is urgency. And um, I would say COVID has um, caused us to uh, delay our that sense of urgency. But I would also say that COVID is a proxy for climate change in that what it is revealing um, and the lessons from that should inform our climate change plans. Beatrice Coco, how do you see it? I would say if we are comparing the similarities between COVID and climate change, we are literally in a co the COVID moment of March. So um, if we're looking at many scientists who are saying that basically the urgency is even just as dire. So I, I would say that we really need to take it a lot further than, than we are than we are currently are at. Hmm. Okay, Mary Lou Tanner, how about you? Well, I think the city's climate change plan is well thought out. However, I'm really concerned that we're not seeing prioritization and a budget attached to the items. And that's where really the rubber hits the road is what are we going to focus on and how are we going to fund it? And that is still yet to come. I don't hear three rave reviews from any of you. Councillor Wilson, uh, what's the city missing so far? I think it's missing a focus. I think it, um, if we look at those cities that have been able to um, galvanize the public um, and to move the marker, um, there are many, many things that have to be done and done differently. But uh, the successful cities are those that boil it down to three or four uh, primary themes and goals. And when interviewing residents, um, they're able to recite those goals. The, the challenge and also the opportunity in Hamilton is uh, the issue of, of equity. And that has to inform our plans and it has to inform our priorities and it must inform how, in fact, we engage with uh, citizens. So as, as you know, in, in Hamilton, we have a, a code red condition. So we have um, a 23 year life uh, expectancy difference between um, our most impoverished neighborhoods and that of our um, most econo economically uh, flush neighborhoods. And so in moving forward, we've got to ensure that that equity component is part and parcel of our climate plans. And it is a challenge in COVID in that often people will say, well, we don't have the money right now. Municipalities are under the gun. And I always say um, we don't proceed with our budget and then tack on climate mitigation and emergency measures. Um, climate change is our budget. That must guide our priorities. Um, and we're not there yet. Understood. Let's, um, just before we go any further, and we certainly will come back to have further discussion on that, uh, you all know David Miller, the former mayor of Toronto, who's got a new book out called Solved, which is an interesting, if not provocative, title uh, on the climate issue. Uh, his view, of course, is that um, we ought not to wait around for uh, federal or provincial governments to solve this when he believes the solutions for municipalities everywhere are right under their noses. And here's an excerpt from the book, on um, why he thinks climate change planning is important. Here we go. Sheldon, could you bring this graphic up? Thank you. In a city government context, the existence of a plan is important because it forces the system, the various departments and agencies, to act by incorporating climate actions in the everyday routine work. It is only in this way that a plan can be successfully implemented, and experience has shown that to mobilize these departments, who might not think climate change is their job, 
it is essential to prescribe goals for them and include them in the development of the plan. In this way, the plan gains from expert input, but also gains the confidence and personal commitment of those well beyond the city's environment department. That's a great point, but Mary Lou, I want to know from your view, how realistic you think that approach is? I do think it's realistic, and I, and I have seen it work in municipalities particularly when it comes from the council leadership and the senior management team. It is about setting goals and setting accountabilities, but it's also rewarding the behavior and the action. You have to sustain the corporate cultural change in municipalities to put climate change first and foremost. When I worked for the city of Hamilton, because of all of the uh, storms that were happening 15 years ago, we had to set up a group that dealt solely with that. And we made significant gains in dealing with managing those storms, not just from planning for it, but from operating and how we planned and had staff out on the streets even prior to a storm coming. We changed how we monitored the weather. There's significant traction on that because the leadership said this has to get fixed and fixed now. Beatrice, the way you look at it and the way that former Mayor Miller has described it, do you think that approach is being undertaken in Hamilton right now? I don't. I think we have a real issue here in Hamilton that we have this love affair of urban expansion. We're kind of expanding. Um, we're looking into expanding, growing areas that are prime agricultural lands. Um, so we really have to come have that commitment to not sprawling, so responsible land use, really focusing on, uh, you know, committing to that uh, firm urban boundaries. So I think that's one of the big pieces um, that we, we we don't have in the plan that absolutely needs to be there because, of course, more more area um, is, is a larger carbon footprint. So, you know, that's what we need to absolutely, in, in, in moving ahead, we have to have that piece in the, 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 the energy plan, the climate plan. Um, and I think also, with, as Mary Lou said, uh, this, the, the, the issues with, for instance, stormwater, um, how, are we, how are we actually doing it? How are we... We need to have fair, uh, you know, fee, stormwater fees so that those who are most responsible for producing this um, runoff, get they should be paying more for those than, than the residents. So I, I, I believe that there's a lot of um, huge gaps in, in, our, in our plan so far so that need to be addressed. Maureen, I saw you vigorously nodding your head at that. <laughs> how, how, much, how much consensus do you think there is on Hamilton Council right now to embrace the approach that David Miller has suggested here? Um, there's a famous saying, right? Everybody wants to go to heaven, but no one wants to die to get there. <laughs> yeah. And um, climate climate change, serious climate change action means absolutely changing the order in which we do things, um, and it must be reflected in our budget. And so to Beatrice's point, um, Hamilton is one of the few large municipalities who does not have a separate funding system for stormwater management. Um, we have many underground urban waterways that are compromised. We are beside um, Coots Paradise, which is a, um, a recognized internationally as a very unique um, in terms of its biodiversity. It's gorgeous. Uh, it's but just for, spectacular. It, it is. Um, there is no place like it. And we are in partnership with the RBG and others in, Royal in its Botanical management. Gardens. Mm -hmm, thank you. Um, but... <laughs> We have a notion that some members of council will, will refer to the idea of stormwater management financing as a, a rain tax, necessarily uh, provocative. Uh, but it can't be part of our competitive advantage when we have large parking lots in which the business, uh, the, the corporate player is not paying their fair share. And that can't be part of their business model because ultimately the cost of that is being borne by uh, uh, residents in Hamilton. Uh, and some, back to my point about equity, we have some people with the very least who are paying the most in terms of their property taxes, whether that's in their rent or in their home ownership. Um, so we have a, a long way to go on that front. I did want to clarify that RBG was Royal Botanical Gardens and not Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who has been a more famous RBG in the news as of late. So for, forgive well, the interruption. Well, both are there. totally awesome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me, this may, Mary Lou, this may be an obvious question, but, um, but let's get it on the record anyway. 
I mean, green spaces are lovely to look at in cities, obviously, but they have a function well beyond that as well. Can you sort of fill in some of the blanks there on why it's so important to have a lot of green space in a city and the value it plays? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so green space, it holds the rainwater. It carries it. It keeps the, when it's at the edge of a creek, it keeps the creek stable and doesn't pollute the creek with runoff into it. These are areas that consider them the lungs of our city, really. So they take pollutants out of the air. They clean the air. They are places where people can be physically active and access nature, particularly in parts of the city where there's more density. Getting into that green space becomes critically important, not just for physical activity, but there's a whole body of literature about people's mental well-being. And when we get outside the true urban areas, those green spaces are the connectivity into the city and what happens upstream is coming downstream. So if you have a healthy environment outside of your urban area, you're contributing to a better urban environment as well. And I think, you know, investing in those areas, making sure as much outside of the urban area as inside of the urban area that they're healthy. So the banks are safe, the water quality is clean, and they move water in a safe, sustainable manner is critical to a healthy city. We had a, um, my goodness, it was just an excellent program on late last night on TVO called The Life Size City. And normally, I mean, that's a multi-part series which normally focuses on some of the biggest cities in the world. And last night's show was about Hamilton. Uh, they were looking at mid-sized cities last night and they put the accent on Hamilton. And, um, well, let's look at a clip from the show and then we'll come back and have a chat, okay? Sheldon, the clip if you would, please. This street is King Street. You see that it's uh, about five lanes of traffic all in one direction. This is probably a fourth body blow we took, and I think it was 1952. They just overnight changed all the streets to one way. Oh, wow. They thought that was a great way to renew a city. Facilitate the automobile traffic, and the rest will follow. So there's been a lot of initiative and lobbying over the years to change main streets in Hamilton back to two-way it would really help to slow down traffic to create an environment where people might feel comfortable again. It was on last night, and if you missed it, it's on again tomorrow night as well. It's a, it's really must-see for people who are interested in how cities work. Um, but my, f boy, oh boy, I mean, I lived in Hamilton uh, from the beginning of my life until age 18 when I moved here, and those one-way streets, I mean, people have been fighting about that for, well, for decades. So let's get into some conversation about this. Beatrice, um, in terms of what's good for the environment, what's your view on the one-way street issue? Absolutely two-way makes sense. Um, the research shows that there's more vibrancy, traffic is slowed, people are feeling more friend, um, capable of walking without fear of you know, the speed in traffic. Businesses thrive. Uh, we see, I think it was 10, a decade ago where James Street was converted to two-way and um, you can just see that the, the vibrancy that's happening there. I must say, though, there is, uh, in Hamilton specifically, we have we have um, the issue of industrial trucks that are kind of barreling through through neighborhoods. And I think this is, a, right now we're going through a, a, a kind of a, a re review of the truck route system. And, you know, you, you'll find that in many of these cases, this, this kind of adds to the pressure on these streets, on these one-way streets as well. Um, it's just... It's just a terrible way to, it's, the quality of life is very much impacted by that kind of situation. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're pushing as Environment Hamilton to kind of really engage the community to, and we're hearing from the community that they don't want this. They don't want this kind of, they want the, the slower traffic. They want that, that a two-way street can bring that, that doesn't have an uh, 18 wheel industrial truck barreling along for it. So, uh, and polluting the air and, and really, really compromised, you know, to Mary, Mary, Mary Lou's, um, uh, comment about the need for that the the, the uh, good healthy green spaces. You know, we're talking about many areas in the city that have very poor tree canopy coverage, um, and all this combined adds to a terrible air quality. And and we really need to change that if we're if we're going to be addressing if we're talking about climate and environment here and livability. Well, of course, the one good thing about the one way well, may, may, there may be more than one good thing, but certainly one good thing about the one way streets. Um, is that you really can get from one end of the city to the other end of the city very quickly. And unlike in Toronto, all the lights are synchronized. So once, once you get going, you can just keep flying. Now, it's, yeah, great if you're in a, it's great if you're in a car. Maybe, Maureen, yeah. you could pick up the story here. It's great if you're in a car, but if you're trying to actually create a little street life and environmental sensibility, 
Uh, not too good for that, I guess, eh? Yeah, I have nothing positive to say about our one-way streets. So let me just put that out there. You can't have a vibrant, fair, livable, sustainable city when you have um, the likes of a 403 going um, on both sides right through it. Um, so if you want to drive through your city uh, efficiently, and that's what it was designed for, and to get workers down to our industrial and manufacturing water uh front yes I, it is the most efficient way in which to move transportations but it's a way in which you can kill your city and um, it's been disastrous if it's so obviously not a good thing is there an appetite on city council to change it uh, i would say for some yes uh, for others no um, it, for many in this in the city uh, they look longingly at the one-way streets and i think Perhaps they equate it with uh, days gone by of, of prosperity and sound um, middle-class, middle-income jobs. And um, But for um, many others, uh, it's been bad for business. It's bad for air quality. It's, 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 just, it's just bad. <laughs> uh, get off the fence and tell us what you really think. No, <laughs> just kidding, kidding, kidding. Mary Lou, um, pick up the story here if you would. We know that... Um, well, you know, Hamilton has had an on-again, off-again relationship with the light rail transit system uh, for many years now. Uh, it looks like the moment it's off as opposed to on, but the province of Ontario has said we still have a billion dollars in our back pocket for Hamilton to do what it wants on the issue of urban transportation. Uh, what do you think it should do? Transit. Transit, transit, transit. Our transit system was designed for the industrial bayfront workforce in the 50s and 40s and 60s, and it hasn't really had a redesign since then. The redesign is coming. It's been stalled because of COVID, understandably, but the redesign is coming, and we need to implement that. I strongly support LRT. I believe it's the right solution for the city. I believe it's the right solution to really kick off a new way of thinking about transit and connectivity and getting people out of their cars. But fundamentally, that billion dollars, which was actually $3.4 billion from the last government, they had signed off on that amount, that needs to go into transit. It should not be invested in roads in any way, shape, or form in this city. Okay, if it, if, if it is transit and it's not an LRT, because that's what the current government of Ontario has said, uh, what are the options? Are we talking fleets of electrical buses? Or are we talk What are we talking? You tell me. So there's a number of options. Bus rapid transit is one where um, buses get, they can have their own lane. They don't need to have their own lane. They can have queue jump signals. So when they're at a light, they go through the light first ahead of the other vehicles. It's about investing in a new fleet. Electric buses are more expensive than conventional buses. It means that you have to invest in the whole train of bad pun, but whole train of the transit system. So buying the buses, the mechanics know how to fix them, the drivers know how to drive electric buses, and that the route de redesign is done. So we're meeting the needs of people where they live and where they need to get to. I live in East Hamilton, and there are parts of my community that can't get to the Confederation GO station by transit. And if you get to the Confederation GO station, in order to connect, you need to take a bus to Burlington to the Aldershot GO station. It, it's madness. Our transit system needs a redesign. We need to invest in the full suite of transit upgrades. It includes electric buses, but it also includes connectivity to GO stations. It's a complete rethink that's needed and the investment to support it. Hmm. Beatrice, let me get you to uh, nudge our conversation along to another area, and we hear this expression all the time now, the 15-minute city. And we know that... Um, Governments are encouraging people to kind of work and live in their own neighborhoods where possible. We're getting a, sort of a, a quick primer course on what it means to live in a so-called 15-minute city where people are encouraged to cycle places, to be able to walk to the things that they need to walk to uh, in their neighborhoods. Um, maybe Just put a little more flesh on that bone. Why would the 15-minute city uh, be crucial to Hamilton's development? Well, we really need to reduce urgently our greenhouse gas emissions it's like this is an a climate emergency we have to reduce the, the, the emissions the best way to do that while building up vibrancy and, and the livability and quality of life is look at your streets right so you know if we're making it more attractive for people more convenient more 
healthy, more fun to be able to walk to places that are really, you know, close to, to where you're going to your local amenities, whether it's uh, groceries or, you know, parks or whatever it is you're going to, it makes perfect sense that these structures, this infrastructure be, be prioritized. Um, even, even within the city, I'm thinking even of transit, um, even pre COVID 19,000 hours of our transit, uh, Hamilton um, street rail ha were cut before even COVID happened. So, we have to prioritize that kind of livability within that 15 minute context, which I, you know, you're looking at France and you're looking at all these cities that are doing that. Um, uh, like Milan, there's so many cities, Bogota, they're all doing that because they understand that, that it's really about the quality of life and the, 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 the need to really bring down those emissions urgently. But Beatrice, follow up with this. Do you think Hamiltonians want this? Yes. I How do, do you know? Because I work with many people that, um, you know, and a lot of them, I must say, a lot of them are people coming to the city and, and, and a lot of people are kind of reawakening to the fact that this, there is an urgency, this makes sense. Of course, many people want to drive and we're not saying don't drive, but within the context of like, you know, you can be a healthier person, you can have a healthier city, you can have connectivity with neighbors, with your own community. You don't have to be driving to certain places like, like that are literally minutes away when you could easily ride a bike, right? So, or, or walk if you can. Um, so those are, so those, I think to say at this point, do they want that? I, I think it's, it's, <laughs> I don't, you have to change. There's no choice, right? Because, um, and, and to make it attractive in that way is, is kind of our, our work in a way. I think we, we have to change because otherwise we're, we're just going to, we're gonna, our missions are just going to go. We're just going to lose the chance to to recover, from, to to move forward, to have a livable future. Really, is that urgent? Um, I just keep trying to bring it back to COVID, and I'm trying to say that we are at the point where our emissions are so high. If we don't do something now, it's going to be too late. No, I hear you, but and maybe Maureen, you could pick up the story here. Um, I don't know what it is in Hamilton, but I can certainly tell you here in Toronto, if you take a subway. Um, Boy, oh boy. I mean, the subway traffic's down at least 80% uh, just because people are nervous about COVID-19. And the subway is clean and everybody's wearing masks, and yet there's still nervousness. So I wonder whether your push for further embracing of public transit uh, is, you know, is that a message people are anxious to hear in a COVID era? Well, to your question of uh, do people support 15-minute um, cities or uh, or neighborhoods they may not um, but it's just because we haven't been having that specific conversation so what i've heard during this time is um, i haven't heard anybody tell me tell me that they miss their two and a half hour drive and their commute and missing their their kids uh, soccer game um, missing the bath time and the bedtime i haven't heard anybody um, talk about um, when they go on top of the escarpment, um, they can actually finally see all the way to Toronto because our air quality during this unusual time has actually improved. Um, in the last six weeks or months rather, I haven't received a single email complaining about the state of the roads. I have received an enormous number of emails talking about green space and how come, Councillor Wilson, I have to go out onto the roadway uh, when I'm on the sidewalk? Um, right. COVID seems draconian in terms of its impact on public space because we have intentionally uh, given up public space over the last um, number of decades. And we've mm -hmm. primarily given up those slices of spaces to the car. If you look down at a sidewalk, you can see exactly where it starts to get a little, little narrower because we decided to put in a turn lane. So that five second wait for that car, you've now uh, prioritized the car over the safety and the well-being and the ability of people to get around differently. So to your point, do people support it? They may not, but if you sit around and talk to people about um, despite how miserable and uh, terrible it's been during this time, it has caused people to pause and say, where am I vulnerable, but also what lessons have I learned? And that's where a conversation about values and experiences come in. Um, and I think that's how you, you build a coalition of the willing in terms of how we plan our cities and where we invest. 
Well, let me pick up on that. Sure, let me pick up on that lesson of uh, on that issue rather of lessons learned. And Mary Lou, uh, let me go to you on this. Cities have been doing things differently since COVID nineteen began. They, they they started doing them because of COVID nineteen, and I'm talking now about an approach to housing the homeless or the creation of more bike lanes or ensuring that there's more walking space in the cities. Um, you know, e extending uh, uh, restaurants out onto sidewalks and that kind of thing to make places more, uh, you know, people friendly. That was all done because of COVID. How much of that do you think is going to continue uh, once we get a vaccine, once we get a better handle on COVID, et cetera? Uh, certainly, I think the restaurants are going to continue. We've seen that that is a lifeline and uh, so important to their future. I think people are now seeing different opportunities and different choices that they can make and different issues in their particular neighborhoods. And demanding that the status quo not continue. I can tell you where I live, we have a great walkable neighborhood. We have transit. It is a 15 minute neighborhood. We can walk to the store and people continually are very thankful for that. And now wanting to see better cycling, better transit, using the transit. But also one of the lessons of this pandemic is homelessness. And in this neighborhood, which is a 50s suburb, we have seen people living in their cars. We have seen people camping underneath uh, bridges. We have seen people camping on the escarpment. And I have seen a humanity and kindness in my neighborhood and my neighbors in supporting those individuals and just not reporting them to the city so they don't get cleared out, but saying, what can we do to help and support you? There is an empathy for ourselves and for our neighbors that I am seeing that I haven't seen in this city in the past. And I think that if there is a shining light of grace coming out of COVID, it is that, that we are seeing that we really are each other's keepers in our neighborhoods. And we have to advocate for the things that are going to make all our quality of life safer, healthier, and better. Beatrice, what are you seeing on the empathy scale? Definitely, there are a lot of, I mean, there's an explosion. Alongside with the COVID crisis, we're looking at also the Black Lives Matter crisis, the anti-Black racism that's been exposed. So I think there's a lot of, um, I'm, I'm hopeful because I feel that people are making the links between the three crises, uh, crises or whatever you say them, um, and really seeing that we can't, we have to have that, what, what they're, they're calling the just recovery. So. Um, the equitable lens for everything um, as we move forward. Um, so I feel that, yes, I feel that there is some hope in that sense that this, this COVID moment has definitely um, created a, a, an opportunity for us to see people as, you know, and, and another big thing I want to say is just essential workers, for instance, you know, we've looked at how, who are the essential workers in our community? Um, they are people that are, that are making sure that we have the food in stores that are bagging our groceries that are cleaning um, the hospitals as well as being helping patients. So I think there is an understanding now, broaden, a broadening uh, appreciation for people, um, but it needs to actually now be, we need to elevate and uplift people who are actually doing these jobs. Um, you know, that hero wage has been ripped off people. Meanwhile, you know, for, for grocery store cashiers and that they had the two hour increase, two dollar um, increase, and now that's been taken away and we're looking at huge um, corporations are making massive profits at the same time. So that is an issue that, that we, you know, I know it's not only Hamilton specific, but um, it's something that, that, that many people are, are kind of pushing back against and saying that this is, this is just not right. Maureen, we've got 30 seconds left here. Let me give it to you and get your take on how Hamilton's doing on the empathy scale right now. Well, our product was steel, but our strength has always been people. That was and, DeFasco's um, expression. Yep. Uh, and I think that came through in your documentary of the um, the life of a mid-sized city in that it's big enough to do many things, but small enough to know who to call to get them done. Um, and so COVID has uh, this, this uh, overstatement. It has revealed many things that we already knew existed. Um, and it has caused many of our neighbors to um, roll up their sleeves um, and become part of the solution. But governments certainly, and uh, as Beatrice said, private business, business must follow. And if it means we have to speak to people's self-interest to do that, then there's no shame in that. Um, but what we have found is that uh, while we're all in this together, 
uh, COVID has affected, affected us differently because of the gross inequalities that exist um, around the world and including in Hamilton. I want to thank all three of you for coming on to TVO tonight and shining some light on this issue. City Councilor Maureen Wilson, Beatrice Ikoko, Project Manager for Environment Hamilton, Mary Lou Tanner, the Principal Planner with the Niagara Planning Group, and I'm happy to remind everybody as well that tomorrow night, 9 p.m. on TVO, if you missed the Life Size City Edition on Hamilton last night, we're replaying it tomorrow night, Tuesday night, 9 p.m., so hope everybody will have a chance to take that in. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.